We have now, we now have his life, and we have great and precious promises by which we can partake of that divine nature. And we must live, and that must be our reality. Amen? The Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So the, 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 the whole big difference, I mean, we could come up with lots of different things, but it's going to come right back down to, it's because of the sacrifice, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Galatians 2 verse 14 says, um, admonishes us to walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Which means what? To walk correctly. To walk accurately in accordance to the truth of the gospel. Now, he said, but they're talking about righteousness. Well, all right, all right. Let's understand this. Because of the sacrifice, that's why there's righteousness. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. And then it goes on to say in verse 17, because therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So the gospel is the power of God. The gospel has the power to produce salvation, wholeness, deliverance. Why? Because in the gospel is this unveiling of the righteousness of God. Is this unveiling of this new authority, this oneness we have with God, the new rights and privileges? Amen? The freedom from condemnation and insecurity and guilt? He says, this is why it's the power. So the, the very essence of the sacrifice, so to be, because of the sacrifice, we are righteous. Isaiah chapter 50, 54. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10, talks about this new covenant of peace. And it goes on to say, in verse, children shall be taught of the Lord. God says, I'm going to teach my children, well, of course, by the Holy Ghost. And what will happen? They're going to become established in righteousness. And they're going to be far from oppression because they will not fear. Amen? Amen? They're going to be far from oppression. No weapon formed against them will prosper because their righteousness is of me. And it started off by talking about this. This is the new covenant I'm going to have. It's a covenant of peace. And he said, and then regarding this covenant of peace, the Holy Ghost will teach us, and we're going to become established in righteousness. What I'm showing you is the connection between the sacrifice, this new covenant, and righteousness. It is the ministration of righteousness. It is the ministration of the Holy Ghost. Amen? So that tells us that our prayer life ought to reflect righteousness. It ought to reflect our authority in Christ. It, in other words, it should not be beggy and whiny and, and crying out to God to do something about the devil when he's given us authority to do something about it ourselves. It must respect righteousness. It must reflect authority. It must, re, it must reflect the rights and privileges that we have. It must reflect this oneness. He is the head. We are the body. He is the vine. We are the branch. The same life in the vine is in the branch. And if our conversation and our thinking and our speaking is in line, then we are in line with that new covenant. It must reflect righteousness. It must reflect the reality of the Holy Spirit of God that is within us. Now, let me walk through some stuff. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says that you and I have been buried in baptism, wherein also you are risen with Christ, through the faith of the operation of God that had raised him from the dead. So, when Jesus, in other words then, when Jesus died, you were in him. And so here you are, according to Peter, you've been born again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, to a lively hope, Christ in you is that hope. Colossians 1.27. So here you are. You got a new identity that comes out of resurrection. That comes out of the fact that you've been raised up with Christ. Let's look at that for a moment. Because it's a reality. Because again, if I'm going to function in this new covenant, I got to function as who I am in Christ. I got to function in the truth. And Jesus is the truth. I can't function under the old covenant. Grace and truth has come through Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth has come through Jesus. So what has happened is, we talk about the eight aspects of the sacrifice of Christ. Well, you and I are involved in each of those eight aspects. And when we look at who we are, 
who we are as a result of who we are in resurrection, who we are seated at the Father's right hand. Let's make a quick look at that. And you will see by the faith and the operation of God that placed us in Christ, we, 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 we will see what some of that is like. It says no in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, know ye not that of many of you have been baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, and that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, you and I ought to walk in this newness of life. In another place, Galatians 3 verse 27, it says as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does all of that mean? You were in Christ when he, when he was crucified, when he was buried, that old man was taken care of and gone, and when he was resurrected, you were resurrected. When he was made to sit at the Father's right hand, you were made to sit at the Father's right hand, and that is where you are right now. That is where you are to function from. When he shed his blood, what does it look like? Number one, that old man was crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that liveth in me. Number two, you are buried with him by baptism into death. Romans 6 verse 4. Number three, you are also raised up together with Christ. Colossians 2 verse 12, we write here, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you were risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. You were raised up with him. 1 Peter 1 3 said, the, the, by the resurrection, you were raised up and born again to a living hope and to an inheritance that is incorruptible. Number four, you know, Jesus was made to be seated at the Father's right hand. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 6 that you were raised up together with him and you were made to sit together with him. Where? In heavenly places. Amen? He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my Father's throne. Whoever is born of God overcometh. Are you an overcomer? You are seated with Christ at the Father's right hand. This is who you are. This is where you are. Now remember, faith, these things, we got to take a hold of them by faith. Faith says, faith, when faith sees right, it sees what is already done. And it says, faith says, uh-huh, this is how it is. He's made me a father of many nations. I believe it. I receive it. It is so. Therefore, it must become so. He is watching over it to perform it. That's how you get healed. That's how you get whatever is already done. And if it's not already done and it's not already finished by the sacrifice of Christ, then you have no business with it anyway. Are you with me? So, where are we? Number four, you see the number five. There is a continual washing by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that you are forgiven. You are perfectly righteous. And I love this scripture, Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, that says that you are made perfect and complete by the blood of Christ. Perfect and complete by the blood of Christ. Number six, you have the very life of Christ in you, living inside of you. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. Colossians 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, shall appear. He is your life. Galatians 2.20, you're crucified with Christ, nevertheless you live, yet it's not you, but it's Christ that lived in you. Number seven, you are living in a place, you are living in, where you, and you have full authority of the name of Jesus. It says whatever you do, do all in the name of Jesus. Now here's a verse of scripture we don't use very much, but it's very important. John chapter 20 verse 20, verse 31. It says, but these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might live, you might have life through his name. So we live in and by the name of Jesus. Number eight, we have great and precious promises. And these promises unveil the various aspects of the, of the new divine nature that you have in your spirit. So when you look just at those eight things, just coming out of the sacrifice of Christ alone, you have a brand new identity in resurrection. Amen? I like the fact that I, I was crucified. The old man was buried. I was raised up, but I am seated. This is where I am. Say I am. Yeah. I am seated. Yeah. The blood is applicable in my life. 
nature. I have his name. Amen. So then, how then do we pray according to the new covenant? <laughs> All right? All right? It means we got to operate in spirit and in truth. But now remember how it says in James that we sometimes ask amiss? What does that mean? It means then that there are times when our asking is not according to the purpose of God. It's not according to his counsel. God does everything according to his own counsel. Sometimes our asking is such that we're wrapped up with anxiety, which creates what? It creates wavering and wandering. And the Bible says that person is not going to receive anything of the Lord. So God says, put aside the anxiety. Do not be anxious for anything. Get rid of it. Amen? Hallelujah. Sometimes you may be asking God to do what he has already done. Can you imagine if I'm asking, would someone please bring my Bible and put it on this table, please, so I can preach from it? It would be kind of silly if it's already here. You follow me? And sometimes we do that with God. We're asking God to do what is already done rather than recognizing what's done and then move and then focus on receiving. Amen? Amen? Or asking God to do what he's told us to do. The switch is, in, is right next to your hand. You turn on the switch. Don't you turn on the switch so that we can have some lights. Don't call the electric company. The power of it is in your hands. Isn't that right? Hello? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So um, we are to, so there is the aspect of not asking amiss, but then there is the aspect of functioning in the spirit, functioning of who we are in Christ. We are a new creation. Created in righteousness and true holiness. Functioning as what we are. Functioning with what we have. Why is it important? The Bible says grace and peace is multiplied. How? Through the knowledge. Isn't that right? Through the knowledge of him. And the knowledge of him gives you the knowledge of you. The Bible says we study to show ourselves approved. Why? Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed. Sometimes I used to think that scripture meant I'm a study so that I could find out. Um, I, I, sorry. That so that if I study enough, then God is going to approve me. But that's not what it says. Second Corinthians, um, I think 2.15. It says study to show yourself, not to show God, to show yourself that you're approved. Amen. When you study, you come to find out he's made you righteous. You come to find out that he, you're holy with his holiness. You come to find out that in his presence you're holy and blameless. You come to find out there's no guilt. You come to find out he's not having any record of your wrongdoing. You come to find out that, uh, that you're sealed by the Holy Ghost. And you come to find out a whole lot of stuff. That that blood has perfected you forever. Amen? You come to find out you're approved. You're not trying to prove to him you're approved. Amen? So it says all scripture is given for reproof, for correction. So that we could function accurately in righteousness. So that the man of God would be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Hallelujah. So we are to function and pray according in spirit as who we are, from who we are, from what we have, as sons of God. Our Father which art in heaven. In other words, come, you are my children. Act like my children. Talk to me as your children. As my children. Amen. And in truth. What truth? Where you are seated in, pray from where you are. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where you're seated. Blessed be the name of the Lord. According to truth, the word is truth. The word that is settled in heaven is truth. Everything that comes out of the sacrifice of Christ, that is truth. But you lay a hold of these things, how? By faith. It is by faith that it might be according to grace that the promise might be true to all the seed. We are saved by grace through faith. It takes the faith to see how it is and grab it and believe it and, and receive it and, and, and talk like it. Let's go through a couple of scriptures here. Hebrews chapter 9. How do we pray from this place? Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 9. Let me just read a few verses of scripture. Verse 11. Christ, <clears throat> Christ being come a high priest of good things to come. Say good things. 
by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. This is the covenant we are in. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We have got an eternal redemption. And that word eternal doesn't just mean everlasting. It means perfect. Cannot be improved. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God, how much more shall that blood purge your conscience from every dead work that you might serve the living God? Your confidence is not in your works. Your confidence is not in some religious activity. Your confidence is in the blood. That blood has purged your conscience so that, that's, so that your trust is in nowhere, nowhere else but what he has done. And for this cause, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive an eternal inheritance. An eternal inheritance. And it says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the one that made the will. Because a will is not in force unless the one that made the will died. Isn't that right? And then it will go on to say that the same way Moses sprinkled the book and sprinkled the people with the blood, so we too have been, so the, so we too have been sprinkled by the blood of Christ. Meaning what? He has enjoyed all the words of this book. All the promises of this book, they are yes and amen, and we are enjoined to God. We are enjoined to God by this blood. That's verse 20. Which is to say that this blood, it, it, it seals and it ratifies every single detail and every single item of the covenant. That's why all the promises are yes and amen. Now you see, don't forget, we are going to we enter into the presence of God by virtue of the blood, what the blood has done. That is where we live, that's where we pray from, from the basis of what the blood has done. We enter into the veil of his flesh because of what, of what was done in his body when it was crucified, when it took the sickness and the disease, when it became a curse. Amen? Hebrews chapter... Um, 10, let's look to, walk through that for a minute. Read it from verse 1. The law having a good, having a, having a, the law having a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of those things, it can never, with those sacrifices that they made in the old covenant, that they did year after year, it could never make those that approach God perfect. But the blood of Jesus did. Amen? The blood of Jesus made those that approach God perfect. You see, if that blood of the bulls and goats could have made them perfect, they would have no more consciousness of sins. But the blood of Jesus has done that, which means that you and I, as we receive the blood, purging our conscience from every dead work, we must not have any consciousness of sins. We must not have any consciousness of separation from God. Back to square one. Are you with me? Must not have that consciousness of separation from God. Many times the whining and, the, uh, uh, and all of that comes from the place where we don't recognize this oneness. We, don't, we, we forget uh, the, the fact that he is in here and the authority that we have in the name. And somehow we're looking at ourselves and our own performance and what we do. How much we did or did not pray. How much time we spent reading the Bible. Or, and, and we're looking at all of our performance rather than trusting in what he has done. And we allow that type of thinking, that type of religious mindset to move us into a place of unbelief. Which means what? Move us into a place of separation from him. And then what happened? We can no longer function correctly in that covenant. Amen? The Bible says we must assure our hearts before him. And then it goes on. I, just, I don't have enough time, but we can read through the whole thing. Let me pick it up in verse, uh, verse, verse 12. It says, this man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice, he sat down on the right hand of the Father, fully expecting his enemies to be made his footstool because of the work that he had done and because of what he know he had done in us. It goes on to say in verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, how? Through the blood of Christ. By virtue of what the blood has done. We can enter into that place, into that place in the holiest of holies. And through the veil of his flesh, and by a new and a living way, through the, through which he has consecrated, 
and dedicated. He says, this is how you do it. It has changed. Now you can come into the holies of holies through my blood and through, my, and through the veil of my flesh that has been torn just like this veil. Amen? And, it says, and then it says, um, and draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having your conscience purged from a, having your heart purged from an evil conscience, letting the blood have its full application on your mind and in your conscience, and your body washed with pure water. Back in Hebrews chapter, um, anyway, um, in Hebrews chapter 12, it's going to speak about the fact that, that um, there is the blood of Christ that speaks better things than that of Abel. I'm going to close this by bringing this here. You know, it says, it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, there are three that bear the word, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. And they say on the earth, there are three that testify. There are three that bears witness. Witness to, to, the, to the truth. And that is, the, which is um, the Spirit of God. He leads us and guides us into all truth. The water, which means the word of God. And then it says the blood. The blood also is testimony. The blood testifies concerning various truths. I had something happen to me several years ago. I think it was 2008, I think it was. I had some dental work done, which is not nice. Right? Not nice at all. It's painful stuff. Anyway, and, um, you know, and because of that, there was, there was some bleeding and everything else. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I look, and I see there was some blood on the bed, and I go like, uh, not nice. Anyway, coming out of that, I don't know at what point, but at some point I had this thing that I got from the Lord. This phrase, keep the blood in your mouth. And that, that has marked me. Keep the blood in your mouth. What is the testimony of the blood? What is the blood saying? Because we need to know what the blood says and say the same thing. Amen? Because that is part of of this, that, that, that marks this new covenant prayer life that we have. It says that God, so let me just, this is part of, for those of you who might have a copy of um, How to Pray the Sacrifice, there's a, a piece from in there, but it compresses it. It says that the God of peace that has reconciled, that has brought reconciliation through the blood by the sacrifice of Christ has perfected everything concerning us. By virtue of that blood. That blood declares that you are justified. That sacrifice and that shed blood declares that every negative cause and effect that came into the human race. Or anywhere in existence for that matter. Because of Adam's fall, the blood fixed it. The blood was a perfect sacrifice that has paid the price even for all of creation. So that what was done in Adam, God did far much more in Christ. And that is why it says he has reconciled everything. Instead of, on a personal basis, instead of sin, we are made righteous. Instead of separation, we have, we have become one with God. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Instead of being re rejected, what? We are accepted. Now these things, these truths are not just intellectual stuff. We got to think this way. I'm not rejected. I'm accepted. I am not separated. I'm one with him. I am righteous. We got to talk that way. We are no longer poor because he was made poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. He became a curse that I might redeem from the curse. Whatever might be happening, there's curses out there. There are curses out there, but he has redeemed us. And you've got to take the truth and stand against that stuff that runs in the family. We're not denying that these things have happened, but we are denying its right to operate in you. Why? Because you have been redeemed. Because of the testimony of the blood. The blood gives you authority over the devil and over all of his works. It gives you that internal inheritance. It makes you righteous. It gives you a covenant that covers everything in every area of your life. It gives you access and authority before God. Access and authority over the devil. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So we have got to get a hold of these things and make them and, and get our thinking to be in line with the truths of how it is because of the sacrifice and because of the Holy Ghost. 
At the end of the day, God is simply saying, look, you are my child. You are born again. You are not who you used to be. You are no longer without God. You are a new creation. You are my child. Come before me at any time because of the blood, through the blood, because of the broken body, through that body, and you come. And you come and you operate, speak, think, and so on according to what has been done and finished. You do that in, the, in that prayer place, but you do that on the outside. Because that is where the victory is. He supplies all our need according to his riches and glory by virtue of what Jesus has done. Amen? So I say that so that we can get a hold of this, that this is what God is calling us to, functioning in this new covenant and cast off that old covenant, old man mindset and endeavor by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the spirit of wisdom and revelation to function as who you are in Christ by virtue of what Jesus has done and by virtue of the Holy Spirit being here. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand for a moment. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. So where is our confidence to be? Paul says I determined to know nothing else except Christ and him crucified. Should it be in my own ability? Should it be in my own goodness? Should it be in who I know except him? No. It says the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But to us it's the power of God. It is the power of God. We, are, we glory and we boast only in this. That by that cross, by that sacrifice, the world is crucified unto us and us unto the world. And we live by this new rule. What is this new rule? It's only the new creation that avails anything. It's only the cross and it's only a sacrifice that avails anything. So let this monk guard around your mind like a garrison of soldiers. Let this harness your thinking. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Lift up your hands. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we praise you. Lord, we worship you and we bless you. We magnify your name. Just say, Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. It applies to my life. It applies to my family. I thank you, Father, for the cleansing power of that blood. It cleanses me. But it separates me unto you. I'm bought with a price. I am yours. And you are mine. I live in your presence. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I'm born of the Holy Spirit. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Father in Jesus name. Let it be so imprinted in my heart. So engrafted in me. That you are with me always. And that Jesus, by his sacrifice, has finished everything that pertains to my life and godliness. So that I could be victorious. And I could manifest your life in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen.